Thank you. You may be seated. I have not yet figured out how to make the amens shorter without making the breaks between the verses non-existent. <laughs> so uh, anyway, please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago out of the book of Exodus. It's an exciting passage. I hope you caught the excitement. I mean, I read that through and I think Pharaoh is getting irritated with Moses and Aaron <laughs> at this point. Did you pick that up? It says he drove them from his presence. You know, and then his, hell, oh, man, it's, things are getting very, very tense at this point. We saw last week that we're moving into the final three stages of the judgment where things are going to intensify exponentially. There's going to be an incredible increase uh, in the tension in the text because what we see going on with Pharaoh at this point is Pharaoh is finally beginning to crack where he's no longer going to exercise self-control and it doesn't matter to him what happens until finally his firstborn is killed and even then he hardens his heart after the children of Israel have left and he pursues them. God guarantees it because God is going to show his mighty judgment on Pharaoh. Paul tells us that that's the reason that God raised Pharaoh up to show God's mighty hand over the most powerful potentate on earth at the time. There is a God in heaven who will, in fact, judge the wicked. So we saw the final three stages of God's judgment. It happens to people. It happens to civilizations. We may be moving into it right now. And I think when you hear what is the painful business of the plague of locusts, Perhaps you will see something coming here in the United States in the very near future. So we saw three things. The three stages, removal of every life support. The locusts ate everything. Egypt was faced with mass starvation. Then we saw the next plague, which we haven't looked at yet, but it'll be utter spiritual blindness. Inability to humanly perceive the truth. That's the plague of darkness there. God plunges them into darkness. He does that with people spiritually, as well as doing it physically here in Egypt. And then finally, that third of the final three stages is death. Death is the removal of all future hope. Death means there are no more chances. When you step out of this body, you have no second chance. There is no purgatory. There is no second chance, as in Mormon theology, where the good spirits uh, that go to paradise come down and teach the bad guys who are down there in hell, and if they repent then in hell, then they can, they can get to one of the three heavens of Mormon theology. The Mormons teach there are only going to be a few who are really in the lake of fire, the devil and his angels, because they didn't manage to get bodies and to get to heaven you have to have a body it's a weird theology uh, and then those who are called the sons of perdition only a handful of people because everybody else gets sort of purified Mormons have a purgatory just like the Catholics do it's not going to be like that folks death that's the removal of all future hope that was the death of the firstborn that gives us our passage that we have in front of us today and you recall last week we looked at two things out of that passage that it are very important for us. They're a warning. First, we saw that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh and his servants. Be careful who you follow. Be careful to whom you give your allegiance. Because when God hardened Pharaoh's heart, now we see in these final stages, God is also hardening the hearts of Pharaoh's servants. It's not just they're getting hard hearts. He's deliberately hardening their hearts. Who are your heroes? Some people have heroes in the media. A certain actor is their hero. Maybe it's somebody who's very powerful, you know, like one of those superhero kind of guys. 
Or maybe it's an ordinary human individual, but he knows so much mixed martial arts that he can take on an army and wipe them all out in 15 seconds. Maybe your hero, if you're a girl, is, is some beautiful actress who always gets her man. Maybe your hero is some military leader of the past. I've known guys like that. Maybe your hero is one of the, the Confederate generals on either side. Maybe your hero is somebody off in history and you look back and you think, wow, great theologian. That's my hero. Who's your hero? Who is it that you follow? I hope that the one you follow is Jesus. And never follow a man or anyone else unless they're following Jesus. Paul said, be ye followers of me even as I also am a follower of Christ. Anytime I or anyone else stops following Jesus, you don't follow me, you don't follow them, you keep following Jesus. God hardened not only Pharaoh's heart, but God hardened the hearts of Pharaoh's servants. They had seen they knew, they understood, and they rebelled and rejected what they knew to be true. They're begging him to, you know, call the guys back, let them go, because, I mean, they were suffering. They saw what was happening to all their crops. They saw what was happening to everything around them. The Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants. Now here's the purpose, that I might show these my signs before him. God is still hardening the hearts of people today. And there is a day coming when he will personally harden the hearts of almost every living human being on the planet. Only the elect will be spared from that divine hardening of the heart. We read the whole passage last week out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I, I encourage you to read it again when you have opportunity. But it's in the context of the return of Christ. That's verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by the word nor by letter from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come first the falling away and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He says, don't you remember I told you all about that? He's going to be able to perform miracles. He'll be able to do all those special signs that authenticated the giving of Scripture, except their counterfeits. And Paul explains it here in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And then it says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now listen to this. Verses 10 and 11 are so important. And 12. For this, uh, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They're going to be just like Pharaoh's servants. Remember, Pharaoh's servants had seen all the plagues up to this point. They'd experienced that plague of hail where they could smell it, they could see it, uh, the, the fires running along the ground as well as the hail falling out of the skies. They were terrified. But they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now listen to what Paul says about those people who receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 11, And for this cause, that is, because they didn't receive it when they had opportunity to receive it. No second chances here, folks. Once you go into free fall, once you fall off the cliff, there is no turning back. Our country may have reached that point. Listen to the verse. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's the hardening of the heart. God himself will delude them. It's not just the Antichrist deluding them. It's not just Satan deluding them. God says, all right, you wouldn't receive the love of the truth that you might be saved. 
I'll send you strong delusion. You remember the sons of God appeared before God in the days of Ahab, and they were discussing how Ahab might be made to fall. And one said, I'll go and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. God says, go, you do it. God himself will send them strong delusion that they might believe the lie who received not the love of the truth. And then listen to what it says, verse 12. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God gave the Egyptians ten opportunities before he judged them. When the children of Israel went into the wilderness, they rebelled against him ten times before God finally said, I'm going to kill all of you and I'm going to let your children go into the land. But all of those aged 20 and over at the time of the Exodus, except Joshua, who remembers another one? Caleb. Caleb. I hope you're paying attention. I see some eyes out there that were closed. <laughs> Folks, the two, only two of the spies came back and brought a good report. The other ten spies God killed. The people who murmured and complained in the wilderness ten times God killed. Interesting number ten. Ten plagues. Ten complaints. Ten spies. How often have you rebelled against God? How often have you turned your back on God? How many opportunities do you have left before you go over the edge of the cliff and you're in free fall? It's a serious question. Not merely the pastor's up there making rhetorical questions so he can use up time. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God, He applies the Word of God, and hopefully, if you haven't hardened your heart, He convicts of sin. Because there's coming a day when God Himself shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But then He turns to the Thessalonians, and how thankful we are for verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Now, if people don't believe in election after they read that verse, I don't know what will convince them. I mean, Romans 9, 10, and 11 obviously are right down the line on it, but I mean, here it says, He hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, and here's how he accomplishes it, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Sanctification means to set you apart. God takes you, he chooses you, he sets you apart so you can't be killed before you get saved, and he brings you to the point where you believe the truth. That's what it says there. It's a great verse. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But then he tells them to stand fast. You see, we have an accountability and a responsibility, each and every one of us, before God. Well, anyway, so, God is still hardening hearts today, and there is coming a day when the hearts of those who are unbelievers, they will have reached the final point of no return. And that was the case that we saw here with Pharaoh. Second last week, we saw that God's purpose is to teach future generations about his character, power, nature, and sovereignty. Our job is to teach our children and our grandchildren. Are you busy doing it? I'm so thankful for the homeschool movement. I mean, that is composed a lot of Christians. There are, there are a lot of secular people who just don't like the academics in the public school. But, and so there are a lot of secular people who homeschool their children too. But Christian parents, what a tremendous blessing, what a tremendous privilege, what a tremendous obligation, what a tremendous freedom we have here in our country, at least for now, for teaching our children. And it's not just teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic. We are teaching them the character of Christ. We are teaching them the sovereignty of God, that there is a God who judges nations when they rebel against him and when they turn their backs upon him. The Holy One of Israel he is called. 
What a, what a blessing. Teach our children so that they will not rebel against God like Pharaoh and like his servants rebelled. So they'll learn to follow Christ. And those who are following Christ, they can follow in their steps. And we are following in the steps of men and women of God for the last 2,000 years who have not turned their back on Jesus Christ, who have not gotten off track, who are looking forward to eternity with joy because they're following in the steps of their master. And parents and grandparents have to follow those steps so that as their children follow them, they will not be led off the path. That thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and thy son's son. Folks, when your kids get married and leave the house, you still have an obligation to your grandchildren. Did you get it? In the ears of thy son and of thy son's son. That's grandchildren. What kind of an impact are you having on your grandchildren? What kind of a spiritual heritage not only have you left to your children, but what kind of a spiritual heritage have you left to your grandchildren? What kind of interaction do you have with them? When you're with your grandchildren, do you just do fun things and go to the zoo and play with their toys with them? And I mean, oh, that's good stuff. Do you ever talk to them about Jesus? Do you pray for them every day by name? You find out what's going on in those tiny, sweet little lives. Would you die for them? I hope you would. Are you teaching them the character of Christ by the way you live? The words that come out of your mouth when you think that those little ears are not listening. Things they pick up just like a sponge and then they begin to repeat them too. To your son and to your son's son, what things I have wrought in Egypt. You remind them, the Jews do this. They want to remind their children what God did in Egypt. Today they remind. The Seder meal at Passover. It's not like pagan Christmas for them. Oh, I mean, there are secular Jews who have a Hanukkah bush, you know, kind of thing. But a lot of so-called Christians celebrate Santa Claus. They're not teaching Jesus. They celebrate Easter bunnies and Easter eggs. They don't teach Jesus in the resurrection. They mix it. Oh, we can have a little bit of this fun stuff here and a little bit of this fun stuff here and we'll mix it all up together. And you know, if you have pure water and you mix in four or five drops of poison, what you've got is poison water. Dear people, are you teaching your children that God's people are different? That God's people are separate? That we've been called to holiness, to the Lord. Much could be said on that. Teach them what I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them that you may know how that I am the Lord. It's by teaching those things that our children and our grandchildren know that God is the Lord. They are accountable. Things are important. There is nothing that is trivial in our lives. Every moment of every day, every resource that we have, Every bit of it belongs to Christ and it should be used to the utmost of our abilities for His glory. Let me give you a little bit of information. We didn't do that last week. We sort of ran out of time. But I'd like to give you a little bit of information about locusts. Of course, you all know that locusts comes in big swarms, right? <laughs> and you know they can multiply in uh, and travel some distances too. The distance traveled can be very great. Swarms have been seen 1,200 miles out at sea. And those are desert locusts. Can you imagine flying in an airplane and you're out at sea and you're 1,200 miles from any shoreline and here's a swarm of locusts? That's a long way to fly, folks. 
course, we shouldn't be surprised. God made the monarch butterflies able to fly all the way from Canada, all the way down to several valleys down in Mexico. And many times on the oil rigs out in the Gulf of Mexico, monarch butterflies are seen lighting on those oil rigs. They have been flying. How fast does a butterfly fly? <laughs> Very slow. You think, how does that tiny little body have enough energy to get all the way across the Gulf of Mexico? And yet they do it. Millions and millions and millions of them every year. And they go all the way down to central Mexico. And there are two, three valleys which have been found down there in, in central Mexico where, where they light and every tree is completely covered with monarch butterflies. And they mate and they lay their eggs. And when that next generation of butterflies hatches, they don't know how to get all the way back to Canada. Oh, <laughs> who's the leader? Well, there aren't any. See, that generation dies off, the first generation that laid those eggs there. And you know what? Every one of them makes it all the way back up to Canada and lays eggs. And then every gener generation after generation. Is there a God who controls even the insects? in the world every tiny butterfly every locust listen some more things about the locusts here some swarms are very large a particularly large flight of the desert locusts across the red sea in 1889 was estimated as 2000 square miles in extent how big is a blanket that's 2,000 square miles? <laughs> 100 miles one direction and 200 miles the other direction. Can you imagine that many locusts? But that's small. Each was bigger than 100 miles by 200 miles. <laughs> but in at least 1889, there was a swarm that was that big. 2,000 square miles. By the way, I'm not making this up. I got that out of the Encyclopedia Britannica. They normally check their sources. You know, it's not one of these urban legends that you find on the internet. 2,000 square miles. The migratory locust with its races has a wider range than any other acridid. That's what locust family is called. It's found in grasslands throughout Africa, most of Eurasia, south uh, in the East Indies, tropical Australia, New Zealand, um, the deserts of Africa, the grasslands of Punjab, uh, India, Iran, Arabia, I'm skipping over parts, just picking up the, the uh, countries here, uh, Soviet Asia, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. In Central and South America, the United States, the Rocky Mountain locust has is a migratory grasshopper. It wrecked havoc on the prairie farms of Canada and the United States in the 1870s, later disappeared. The clear winged grasshopper is a major crop pest in North America. Once well started, a locust plague is almost impossible to check, and only palliative measures can be used. These have included the destruction of egg masses, digging of trenches to trap the nymphs, the use of hopper dozers. Ever heard of a hopper dozer? If you lived in the Midwest, you have. Those are wheeled screens upon which, uh, upon which striking which the locusts fall through into troughs containing water and kerosene and poison baits and for dusting and spraying of swarms and breeding grounds with insecticides from aircraft. think, ah, that must be the, the way to do it. However, DDT, which kills almost everything else, proves virtually ineffective against locusts. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. And it goes on and talks about some of the other poisons that are used, but unfortunately those poisons which work also soak through the skin of human beings and kill human beings. Not fun. Um, Dieldrin and more recent organic insecticides also are used. Application from aircraft has proved helpful in subduing incipient swarms, but concerted efforts by ground forces are still necessary to control the nymphs and the non-migrating adults. The control problem is made difficult by the great extent of the territory affected, with many invasions beginning in sparsely populated undeveloped regions. They get started someplace where there are people who don't see them coming, and suddenly there is the swarm. Permanent control requires both national and international action. Control, such control is possible because locust swarms do not arise simultaneously over wide regions, but emerge in a few outbreak areas, many of which are known. So they have to keep their eyes open for it. Do you think God can use little things to bring down proud and haughty people? 
He certainly does. Think about the number of plagues in which insects are involved. Out of the ten plagues, 40%. Teeny tiny little things that God used to bring them down. All right, well then we move right back on. That now brings us back to the third practical lesson from our text. Third, the greatest sin underlying all other sins is pride. We're looking at Pharaoh, remember? It's pride that keeps us from doing what we know to be the will of God. Did you know that? Pride is what keeps you from doing the will of God when you know it. I think you can connect pride to every time that you have chosen not to do the will of God. You say, well, one time I was afraid. No, that's pride, because you're thinking about yourself instead of thinking about what God wants you to do. We can bring all of those other motives and we will discover that there is a connection with pride. No matter how nice you are, no matter how sweet you are, no matter how nice and sweet other people think you are, if you're resisting the work of God in your heart, if you're resisting the work of God in your heart, remember we're talking about Pharaoh's heart, we're talking about the hearts of his servants, they're resisting the work of God in their hearts. If you're resisting the work of God in your heart, it ultimately goes back to pride. Verse 3, Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to, what's our next word there? Humble. You guys, keep your Bibles open. <laughs> How long will you refuse to humble thyself before me? You see, he had a problem with pride. Let my people go that they may serve me. Do you know why God hates pride so much? The reason God hates pride is because pride is the sin of the devil. Isaiah 14 tells us that. Here we have a description of the fall of Satan, of Lucifer, beginning in verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, and even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Whoa! I mean, this is... They can hardly believe it when they see him. Art thou also become weak as we are? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy viols. The worm is spread unto thee, and the worms cover thee. You remember when I, I preached in Sunday evening in the book of Acts about Herod, and he's standing up there giving a speech, and everybody said, it's the voice of a god, and they all clapped, and he, he took it in pride, and God hit him with worms, and it says, the worms ate him, and he died right in front of him. Quump. We talked about the places in the Bible that talks about the worms eating you. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. That was the title of the uh, sermon that evening. Anyway. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? He has been doing it here in the United States, if you haven't noticed. For thou hast said in thine heart, now listen, here is five great I wills. Every one of them goes back to pride. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. That's the temple mount in Jerusalem where God is worshipped. In the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. He's challenging God. Yet shalt thou be brought down to hell. To the sides of the pit. All those that walk in pride, God is able to abase. Remember that. And as you look at the various sins that may be plaguing your life, you'll discover that usually the reason that you haven't repented of it is because of pride. You don't want to admit. You don't want to admit that you have sinned. We make excuses. We are such a, a group of rationalistic excuse makers. And we, we try to pretend that it's not really sin. Uh, it was a mistake. Or, well, it really wasn't that bad. Or, the other person made me do it. Or, the other person was bad. Dear people, until we humble ourselves, we're exactly like Pharaoh was here in this passage. Exactly like Pharaoh. New believers should never be put in authority in the church because it only sets them up 
for getting a fat head and God judges them. You must not have new believers because what are they tempted to? They're tempted to pride. Listen to what Paul says. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. That's where you see the illustration of how he'll deal with the church. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Verse 6. Verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Paul's taking us back to Isaiah 14 that we just read a moment ago. Verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The devil catches those who don't have a good report among the unbelievers. They can look pious on Sunday in church, but in the work week during, they're just like the rest of the world. And you know what? They'll fall into the snare of the devil there. A lot of stuff takes us all the way back to the Exodus. Pride in leadership leads to oppression and death. That's Pharaoh. Humility in leadership leads to courage and service and freedom. That's Moses. God is setting two men in contrast so that we might learn something about what God blesses and what God curses. Pride leads to oppression and death. That's one form of leadership. Humility and leadership. Moses is called in the scriptures the meekest man on the face of the earth. What a contrast with Pharaoh. Meekness does not mean weakness. Meekness means power under control and obedience to authority. That leads to courageous service and that leads to freedom. Moses is going to lead them to freedom out of the bondage of Egypt. Fourth, continued rebellion and refusal to obey God leads to the removal of all life support. The locusts ate everything. It was so interesting. You know, we just talked about some big plagues of locusts that have been seen in modern times. He tells us that there were so many of them, it was never seen like that before in Egypt, and it would never be seen like that again. That was the largest plague of locusts that the earth has or will ever see. You know, that happens, this business of um, the removal of all life support, that happens spiritually as well as physically. If you stubbornly refuse to do what you know God wants you to do for whatever purpose, doesn't matter what your reason is, it will result in spiritual starvation. There's some marvelous verses out of the book of Amos, Amos chapter 11. He's talking here about spiritual starvation. Listen to it. There's Amos 8, verse 11 through 13. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. You know, most of us worry about starvation and famine, and it will happen here in the United States. I'm convinced of that. You saw how quickly the land of Egypt was wiped out in a day. I mean, it could be any of these other things. We've talked about all the other possibilities as we've gone through the various plagues of the different ways that God could destroy the earth, the different ways that God could destroy the United States, the different way he could take down everything with a, an EMP explosion up in the atmosphere somewhere. God could take it out with a plague of locusts. A little bitty bug comes and eats everything that's green in the whole United States. <clears throat> you know, folks, there is a God who will be served. And there's a God who will judge those who will not serve him. Verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. 
In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. But remember he said it's not a thirst for water. It's not a famine of bread, but of hearing the word of the Lord. Suppose at this minute, the doors opened here, and a couple of guys came in, and they shot me dead. And I said, okay, who are the elders in this church? And they shot Keith and Walt dead. And then they said, next week, this building is going to be used for the propagation of whatever the new thing is that the government wants done. And you will be here. And they take your names and addresses as you walk out the door. And you try to tune into your Christian radio station on the way home and you discover that the station has been taken over. You try to tune into TV and suddenly you realize, whoa, what, what's going to happen? And they knock on your door and they say, you're in that church. We're coming through your house and we're going to take every Bible you've got. The worst kind of famine is not a famine for bread and water. The worst kind of famine is when you no longer can hear the word of the Lord. Are you prepared? Amos 8, 11 through 13. Fifth, stubbornness prevents rational thinking. God will not tolerate partial obedience and he does not cut deals. You remember how Pharaoh taught, said to his servants, he said, I mean, the servant said to Pharaoh, how long are you going to let this guy be a snare to us? You know, let him go and serve the Lord. And so he calls him back in and says, well, who's going to go? And they say, well, everybody's going to go. And we're going to take all of our animals with us too. And he said, no, no, no. He says, the way I understood it the first time around, the way I understood it was just the men are going to go and you leave everybody else behind and you leave all your animals behind and you leave your wives behind and you leave your children behind. Get out of here. I'm not going to have any more of it. And he drove them from his presence. Now, you know, oh man, I can't believe it's a quarter after. Because I wanted to talk about how even a curse can be beneficial. Did you know that the locust can be beneficial? I'm not going to get into that. There is so much exciting stuff. We're going to have to spend three weeks on locusts. Hey, this is one of the longest of the plagues. <laughs> so there's a lot of verses in here that deal with locusts. But did you know that the Bible actually says that locusts can be beneficial? you got to be just so for the locusts to be beneficial to you. But I'll be reading you Bible verses, the Lord willing, next week that talks about the locusts being beneficial. Did you know that the locusts are given to teach wisdom? Now that's in addition to being beneficial. I mean, I'm talking really beneficial. Uh, but the locusts are also designed to teach wisdom. Did you know God has a whole section in Scripture dealing with locusts teaching wisdom? What have you learned in terms of wisdom from, well, bugs? <laughs> I hope a few things you've learned from the bugs that we've already looked at. <laughs> All right, let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your power. You are the God who controls the little tiny things, the details of life. It's not just you're out there moving big stuff around and letting all the little stuff fall through the cracks. And you're a God who cares about the details in our lives. Well, Father, help us to also recognize that those details that deal with sin are not to be ignored, but they must be dealt with, because if we don't deal with them, you will. Just like a parent tells his children, you take care of that, or I'll take care of you. Father, we thank you that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We're talking heart issues here today, Father. The heart of Pharaoh. The heart of Moses. The heart of Pharaoh's servants. The heart of your children our hearts. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Give us the courage by your Spirit 
not to walk in pride, for those who walk in pride you are able to abase. Help us to humble ourselves. Pharaoh refused to humble himself. Help us to confess our sins, to repent of our sins, to walk in the paths of righteousness, step by step by step, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And Father, let us never follow men here below who veer off that path, who are no longer walking in the steps of Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today, if I can find the bulletin, 